Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So I'm very pleased to uh, introduce Madhu Parthasarthi to you. He has been visiting us for the last few days. Uh, he's currently a professor at uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in the Computer Science Department. And he received his PhD in 2002 from the Institute of Mathematical Sciences in Chennai, India. Uh, Madhu has done uh, very interesting work uh, in uh, the theory of languages and in automata theory. And he's interested in uh, analysis of uh, software verification um, and static analysis. And today he's going to tell us about some work that has bearings both on language theory and on analysis of concurrency. Thanks. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about a tractable subclass of um, context-sensitive languages, um, which we have defined using multi-stack automata. And this is joint work with Gennaro Parlato, who is a student from Italy, who is visiting me for more than a year now and his advisor there, Salvatore Latore. OK, so, so first, a few words about words. Um, words are just linear label structures. So you just have a linear structure with, with a finite labeling on it. Uh, it is an incredibly natural and ubiquitous model uh, which we use every day. So, so you know, basic computation course you take, you'll, you'll see computation as essentially Turing machines, which are defined over word languages. Um, we see behaviors of systems. Um, uh, if you take a behavior of a hardware circuit, we see it as linear, the linear behaviors as words. Um, <coughs> we have, in fact, you know, uh, logics for linear, linear time, so to speak. Um, data is always viewed as, um, almost always viewed as words when it's represented. You know, your files are words and so on. Okay, so the, the theory of automata on words and, uh, which is the theory of regular languages, has played a, an important role. Um, and the, the role, the, the importance has also got to do with the fact that it's a robust class, right? So it's, it's closed regular languages of words um, are closed under all Boolean operations. Uh, you have decidable emptiness of inclusion. And there, it's very robust in the sense that it has multiple characterizations using grammars, regular expressions, monadic second order logic, uh, monoids, and so on. Uh, the applications have, you know, if you take a classic you know, textbook on automata theory, you would probably find string searching. But I think it's more used nowadays in modeling uh, and verification. Um, um, in, spec in, in particular, the logics LTL and sugar, uh, which have come out in the hardware world to verify systems, are based on um, uh, linear words, and the model checking is based on automata theory. Okay, so here's uh, here's a different uh, creature called a nested word. Okay, it's just a linear word. Um, with the same labels as I had before, except that I have a nesting relation defined on the word. Okay? So the red edges are nesting edges, and um, it's, uh, they relate positions uh, to positions, and uh, I won't define it uh, formally, but it's a, it's a well-nested structure. Right? You don't have crossings. Right? And that's a nested word, and I, I want to argue that this is a very uh, natural model on which we want to build a language theory. Okay? <clears throat> so here are some examples of nested words. If you take any, any kind of term uh, or an expression, it's really a nested word where the bracketing gives you this nesting structure. Right? So an expression like, an arithmetic expression like that is really a nested word. And in fact, parsing is all about um, you know, using this nesting structure to check if the word, what, that, what that term means. Okay? So programs are also um, nested words in this sense. 
Okay. So here's another example. XML uh, documents are also nested words. For, so XML documents are documents that describe hierarchical data. So you have some hierarchical data and you describe it in a linear fashion as a word. Then you essentially encode the tree using a word, uh, using um, uh, decorative brackets, uh, which are the open tags and close tags. And the nesting relation is naturally present there. And uh, any XML processor essentially uh, uses these nesting relations to reason about the document. So here's the example which we are interested in today um, is, um, is uh, verification. If you look at the linear run of a program, which is recursive, then you can look upon it as a nested word where <coughs> you have this linear run and you have nesting relations between the uh, between positions that corresponds to that correspond to calls and returns to procedures, right? and that's again naturally a nested word. Here's a non-standard example: is uh, bonding in RNA. It also turns out to have a nesting structure. Okay, so if you look at uh, RNAs which fold uh, rapidly, and the folding in fact determines the properties of the RNA. Um, the, uh, when, so this is the RNA strand, and when it folds, uh, it folds in such a manner that uh, it kind of relates certain pairs. Uh, these pairs are uh, attract, um, uh, and therefore they, they form bonds, right? And uh, this also gives a nesting relation. This is a higher nesting than this, for example. Right? So you can model it as trees, and in fact, people have modeled it as trees. And you have used three edit distances in, in algorithms to reason about this. But they're really, you know, if you see them as words, they're really nested words. Right, so why not just talk about trees? Why is it important? Why, why is a nested word as an abstraction uh, if it's really just a tree? Why do you want to create something new? Something different? So um, you could just talk about trees, and all, most results would follow. There are some results that don't follow, and I'll come to that. So, so what I'm trying to do now is actually just to do a quick summary of uh, nested word automata. I'm going to move to multiply nested words, which of course don't look like, you know, they, they would not be trees at all. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. OK, so here's a, an automaton model which uh, Rajiv Alur and I defined in 2004. Uh, it's called visibly pushed down automata, right? Um, the, the visibly pushed down automaton model is really a push down automaton on a nested word, except that um, assume that every, on a, for every nesting, assume that you have a different kind of symbol saying that this is the beginning of a nested edge and this is an end of a nested edge, like in an XML document, right? So your alphabet is partitioned into calls and returns and internals. Um, calls are the places where nested edges start, returns are the places where nested edges end, and internals are places without nested, nesting edges at all. So all you have to do is restrict the pushdown automaton to do the following. Right? You have a pushdown automaton working on this word, but all you have to do is uh, restrict it so that it pushes onto the stack exactly one symbol when it reads a call. Okay, and it, uh, it pops from the stack exactly one symbol when it does the return. So essentially what you're saying is that it can recover the nesting edges present in the document, but pretty much nothing else. You know, it, it can't do anything else. Yes? Is there the relation between calls and returns one to one, or could there be several re different returns to one call? There could be several returns to one call. Um, and uh, it's important that we do not have any epsilon transitions uh, which, which use the stack. Okay, so here's a, it's a very simple definition, and I think the nice part about this definition is that it's a very natural definition for various classes, which are, which are you know, various uh, people who use push down automata to handle these kinds of systems often essentially do this. They, they do restrict themselves to this class of push down automata. <laughs> And putting this restriction actually helps. Okay, so what is the um, 
So what is the main thing uh, about visibly pushed on automata? The stack height is determined by the word and not by the automaton, right? So if you have this word, I know I'm going to push here, and I'm going to, I know I'm going to push here, and this is a stack height, right? And it goes down when I do a pop, and so on, right? And um, the point is that no matter which visibly pushed on automata you use, it'll have the same stack behavior, right? And what does that give us? Um, so let me call visibly pushed down languages as the class of languages accepted by visibly pushed down automata. Then these visibly pushed down languages are closed under union, uh, but they also closed under intersection because if you take two automata A and B, since they have the same the, the same points, they push and pop. Uh, it turns out that uh, you can take the intersection of them because you can you can push both symbols they were supposed to push and so on. So this is a, the main difference with context-free languages, which are not closed under intersection. OK, so here's the main difference. And this is the main difference with tree automata, I think, is that is determinizability. Uh, what you get is that every non, for every non-deterministic automaton, there is actually a deterministic VPA which accepts the same language. Okay? And uh, the proof is not the same as the subset construction, but it's fairly similar. Um, and it turns out that this is very useful to build certain streaming algorithms for, for uh, let's say, XML documents. Right? If you want to build a streaming algorithm, what you really want is a deterministic automaton to process the document. So for example, if you wanted to type check XML documents, you would just run this deterministic uh, visibly pushed on automaton on it. You just have to simulate it and it will give you an algorithm for type checking. Okay? And it's not clear how to do that with tree automata because the tree automata would require you to construct the tree and then run on it. Okay? So determinizability also gives closure under complement and we have that actually VPLs are closed under all Boolean operations. <coughs> so here's the summary of results. Um, so it's closed under various operations like regular languages. It's determinizable. Uh, of course, it is decidable emptiness. And because of closure under complement, it has decidable inclusion. We've also found several quasi-minimization results, which, uh, which do not follow from the tree world, um, is that uh, we've defined certain class of modular VPAs. So think of these as like programs which have been separated into procedures like, uh, like, like programs, right? And if you have machines of that sort, then we can show unique minimizability results very similar to regular languages, um, DFAs. Um, we've also developed learning algorithms in the style of Angolan where you can learn uh, a VPA um, in polynomial time. So really, visibly pushed down languages are very close to regular languages. And as Tom mentioned, they are very close to the theory of regular trees, and that's why you get all this robustness. <coughs> so, the, so visibly pushed on languages have, have kind of become popular in the automata world and the logic in automata world. Um, so, so they have applications to verification. But they have applications to other things, uh, other domains like XML, which I talked about briefly, but also to stranger uh, domains like game semantics for programming languages, where it was actually used to prove something which was open for a very long time. Uh, people have used visibly pushed down languages to, to show uh, a certain, some problems are decidable. Um, I think the basic thing is that um, people who have been using context-free languages for certain domains suddenly realize that, oh, I could use visibly pushed on languages. And, uh, and, th and therefore, they, they use it, and then they get new results. So the last time I counted, there were about 25 papers written uh, after our paper. So. <coughs> so what is this talk about? We want to preserve the visibility um, of, of the, of the um, input language, right? Namely, that it determines what stack operations we perform. We want to extend it to multi-stack visibly pushed down languages. And essentially, um, we, we place a bound, um, namely that is k phase. And we show that there's a class of languages 
called K-phase multi, multi-stack visibly pushed on languages, which um, goes beyond context-free languages in the sense that there are languages which are not context-free, and it's a subset of it's a subclass of context-sensitive languages, and yet this class is robust in terms of uh, closure under Boolean operations, decidability, emptiness, inclusion, all the nice things that you want. <coughs> okay. Um, so before I start, of course, multi-stack automata would be useful in verification of uh, concurrent Boolean programs. So if you had a concurrent program and you did predicate abstraction, say, on it, and then you got a concurrent Boolean model, if you wanted to do reachability on it, right now it's undecidable, right? I mean, it is undecidable. And uh, you could use uh, this to gain more, uh, more depth into your search space. Uh, basically, if, if you, you can search a, a large amount of space, which is determined by this class, which I'm going to define. OK, so how do we define this class? Let's fix a num n stacks, uh, which, is going to be, which is going to be fixed. And we'll fix a, an alphabet corresponding to these n stacks, which are essentially disjoint alphabets. Uh, and let me call these push and pop um, alphabets. So you have one push alphabet and one pop alphabet for each stack. And you have a, uh, a set of internal transitions. Intuitively, when you read, um, so a multi-stack automaton is on working on a word over sigma would uh, essentially push onto the ith stack whenever it reads an element in push i and pop from the ith stack when it reads pop i. And it is not allowed to touch the stack when it reads an internal action. Okay? So it's a very simple definition. And if you look at programs, of course you know which program is doing the recursive call. And of course, you could. this is not a restriction at all. Um, the visibility is not a restriction at all. So it's a nice definition, but it gives us nothing because the emptiness problem is undecidable. Okay? Yes? So these alphabets can overlap. Sorry? Yeah, these alphabets can overlap. Uh, no, they don't. They cannot overlap. They're all disjoint. Yeah, okay. they're all disjoint. OK. So I call this the slinky, slinky proof of undecidability for multi-stack languages, right? Um, so what is this, what is this, how, does it, how does the undecidability proof go for two-stack automata reachability, right? Uh, you, you simulate a Turing machine, right, using two stacks. And what you do is you have the Turing machine of, uh, configuration of one stack. You pop this, and you push it into this. Yeah, it's like a slinky move, right? You push this, so you essentially you're taking the stack and you, you move to the stack. And uh, when you're doing that, you make one move of the, of the Turing machine. By looking, it's at some point you have a state, reading a symbol, it's very local. You can change that and re rewrite the new configuration onto the other stack. Okay, you keep doing this, and you can simulate the Turing machine. Okay? <clears throat> so visibility does not help at all in emptiness anyway, right? Uh, because uh, the moves you're performing, you know, it's some word, and so emptiness uh, it does not get uh, simpler if you have visibility. So, so how do you get across this, this slinky construction? So one thing which has been noted by Shaz and uh, Jacob uh, in 2005 is that if you allow only switching between the stacks a bounded number of times, Right? So you, you're allowed to work only on one stack in one, f one, s one phase. And then you can switch to the other stack. And you can switch only finitely many times, bounded, boundedly many times. Then this slinky construction fails. And in fact, you can show that the, the problem is decidable. Emptiness becomes decidable if you go move to this class. Okay. There's also some nice work on nested locks where essentially what happens is they, this is by Vineet Kalon and uh, others at NEC, what they allow, disallow is communication between the threads. So you, you lose this uh, global control, uh, which is essential to, for you to pass information from one stack to the other, right? Um, <clears throat> but they just use locks, and uh, nested locks, and then one can show that you get a decidable emptiness problem. Okay? But uh, in some sense, both the above Approaches are, um, are very similar to context-free reachability. I mean, the first one, in fact, uses context-free reachability 
uh, um, a, a finite number of times to get uh, reachability of the whole problem. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, the reachable configurations is regular in both the cases. Okay? So if you write down the stack one after the other, um, uh, for, for, for push down systems, it's known that the set of all reachable configurations represented as words gives a regular language. You can see as the, uh, that is the reason why it's really decidable. Um, and um, in, in both these approaches, that still holds. Okay, so, so the, here's a simple idea to beat the slinky. Is this, um, is, is, is this, that I'm going to restrict you to pop only from one stack. Okay? So in e every phase, you can pop from one stack, but you can push on to all stacks. Right? Now the point is that if you, to do one slinky move, you need to pop from this and push here, which I allow, right? which even the bounded context switching will not allow, even one copying of this um, stack into the other. Right? But I, I make you pay for it. Right? <coughs> so each, intuitively, each slinky step should cost at least $1, and you have only K dollars to spend. Okay? So more precisely, I require that the multi-stack visibly pushed on automata work in k phases. All right? In each phase, it can pop only from one stack, and it can push onto any stack at any time. Okay. So here are the main results. Uh, the class of languages accepted by k phase uh, multi-stack visibly pushed on automata uh, have these properties, they have a decidable emptiness problem. And this turns out to be uh, quite a hard proof. Um, I don't know of a simple proof, so um, it's quite a hard proof. It's closed under all Boolean operations, um, it, and therefore it has decidable inclusion and equivalence. And we can also show that it's much stronger than the previous classes in the sense, because we allow a bounded number of slinky moves, we, we go beyond context-free languages, and uh, reachable configurations is not regular, really. Yes? For the purpose of this, do you actually you, you prove that it's decidable, or I mean, do you, do you show an algorithm and prove the algorithm correct, or do you, do you just show that there exists an algorithm, I mean, that it's decidable methods? No, we, we, we give an algorithm. Oh, okay, I see. No. That's not that hard. <laughs> yeah. How feasible is the algorithm? Yeah, I'll come to that. It's, uh, it's going to be doubly exponential in the number of phases you allow and singly exponential in the number of states. Okay, okay so how do you view these k-phase um, words, right? So remember that the word, the, 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 visible, the word is visible in the sense that the letter tells you what, what you must do on the stack. So this is really like a nested word, but except that you have multiple nesting edges on the word now. And what you're really asking is, can I decide a class of graphs which, are, which look like this? So look upon these as graphs, with these as unary predicates, perhaps. And you ask, what is, what, how, how do I decide this, right? Now, the, the, pretty much the only way people know how to decide graphs, infinite classes of graphs, is this class known as tree interpretable graphs, is that you, you take your graph and you interpret it in the tree. Okay. So the nesting, if you had a single nesting edge, the normal tree representation of it is, is also a tree interpretation of the graph. Right? So this is pretty much how people know how to do decidability, and we'll follow the same thing. We will show that k-phase words are in fact tree interpretable. So what does tree interpretability mean is that you, you somehow take every graph and you represent it using a tree, right? And you show that the class of graphs that you get is regular, right? And therefore, you can use uh, uh, logics on trees to decide about this, uh, about this class of graphs. The tree interpretation is very complex. Okay? So let's take an example. So this word here is a three-phase word. Okay? So, so note that I don't need to look at the automaton because the word tells you what to do on the stack, right? So I'm first operating on the, f I'm, I'm popping from the first stack in the first phase. I'm doing pop from the first stack. So you, A and A prime belong to the first stack, B and B prime belong to the second stack, 
and E is an internal. Okay. So I do a pop from the first stack, so I'm, I'm, I'm in this phase, right? But I come all the way here and I see a pop of the second stack, so I have to switch phase now. With the red guy is the first stack. The red guy is the first stack. But you did pushes on the red guy too, right? Yes. A, a is the push, A prime is the pop, right? Yes. A and A prime are the push and pop of the first stack. So, I see. So, but you, okay, I see. But you didn't pop the second guy. That's yeah. why it's the first Right. Oh. I note that I'm pushing onto the second stack, but I'm not popping yet. Okay, okay. And I come here, and I'm now I want to pop to the pop on the second stack. That's phase two. I, 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 these three belong to phase two. I mean, these four. And then I'm popping the first stack again. That's phase three. So you switch a phase whenever you need to switch popping. Switch, popping. switch which stack you're popping from. Right. Okay. So uh, if you look at this, um, the way to encode this into a tree is first I'll have labels which correspond to the letter there, but also the phase number I need to encode. Okay. So that's the first letter A is encoded in the root with A1, right? And you look at the first phase. What I do is I essentially encode it as a tree, right? And this tree is uh, the natural tree you would come up with for embedding an, a nested word onto a, onto a tree. So note that I, I'm only interested in the red edges now, right? So I do a, a um, this is A, and the corresponding A prime here, which is the matching pop, is encoded on the right, okay? And the word between A and A prime, which is E, B, A, A prime, is encoded here on the left half of the subtree. And the rest are encoded in the right half of the subtree, which is B and A, a here. Okay? So what you do is essentially in this tree, you want the right edges essentially to correspond to the, the nesting edges. Right? So this is the nesting edge, nesting red edge in that. And similarly, this is a nesting red edge corresponding to A and A prime there. Okay? So that's phase one. Okay? And this is, this is easy. Now what you do is when you move to phase two, you plug in the pops uh, corresponding to the pushes on the, on the fir from the first phase. Right? So for example, um, so, so the ordering was this, remember? Right? And when you do the pop, you have to look at the last pop, last push you did, which is this B, and you attach this B prime here, right? That is a phase two, right? Um, that's B prime, and then E, and then the next B prime goes here because that's the matching push for it. Okay? <coughs> and then you move to phase three. Wait, I'm sorry, just B prime, so which is which in the, in the word? So the first B prime is this. The first one, the first B prime is that one, let me just see. Because the ordering here was yes, I this. I see it, I see it, I see it. The first push is this, I mean the last push is this, so the first pop is this. Yeah, so that's the first B prime, and let me just see this. And then you have E, and then you have B, this last B prime. Yeah, okay. Yikes, yeah, so okay. You can mention that uh, after you push something, on the left subtree, you do whatever computation that needs to be done until you pop it. And on the yes. right subtree, you do the continue next. after the continuation. Right. Okay. So that's within the subtree, right? But you'll have to move the subtree, which you're encoding, if you're doing a pop, which you've already pushed on a different phase. Okay? Okay, so, so what we're essentially doing is that we're making the nesting edges, which are really hard for, for linear structures, we're making the nesting edges very simple because there's a right child here. Okay? What's the B prime over there? The last one on the line. <coughs> this is A prime here, you mean? No, no the, the next one, the third, the third B prime in the word. The, no. the, the, the epsilon. The one without the letter. It doesn't have a matching B. I think it's wrong. Yeah, okay. Okay. Right. Sorry, that's fine. That's what I wanted to hear. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I'm really confused. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, sorry. So that, that doesn't exist. So there are only three elements of phase two in the tree. Let's figure that. Okay. 
So I've encoded the nested edges very simply in the tree. You just take the right edge and you get, get back the nesting edges. Right? But I've completely lost the linear edges in the tree. Okay? So the linear ordering on this tree, if I want to recover from it, what I have to do is essentially go down this and then go down here. That's fine. Right? And then I move to phase two and I have to look at the last push uh, to recover what is the next, next event which is this B prime. Okay? I do this and then I go to the second last push and I do that. Okay? Okay, so the linear edges get really complex. Okay, from he moving from here to here is completely non-trivial. Okay? So what's happening? So this is so what the general the way the tree looks like is that you have phase one. Phase two is hang out of hang out from phase one, uh, the phase one subtree. And phase three can hang from the phase two or the phase one subtree. Right? Because th this could be a pop corresponding to a push you did in the first phase. This is a pop you co corresponding to a push you did in the second phase. Now if you wanted to just recover the linear order, right, if E1 and E2 are different phases, then it's simple. Just compare the phase numbers. Right? If E1 and E2 are the same phase, but belong to the same subtree, then it's easy. You just check which, uh, how they occur in the infix ordering in the tree. Right? But the, the hard part is if you have two of these in, let's say, the red uh, subtree, Right? You have one element here and one element here. Comparing well, which of them occurs first is really hard. What you have to do is you have to look at the parent here in the green and look at which came first. Right? And this you have, may have to do k times because there will be k nestings of those. So again, if this event E is less than E prime here, if F is greater than F prime here. Okay, and the order switch. Because you have to look at the later one, later push to relate the first pop. Okay. So, um, so it turns out that the linear order of the word is recoverable using monadic second order logic on the tree. Um, so remember, it's not just an algorithm which you can do. You have to do it using an algorithm which is a finite memory to, uh, to implement using a tree automaton. Um, it turns out that the linear ordering is recoverable easily, but the um, successor is even harder to recover. And what we do is we build a two-way alternating tree automaton in order to recover this, uh, the successor. And uh, finally, what we can do is, once we get the linear ordering, we can simulate the, the original uh, multi-stack visibly pushed down automaton on the, on the tree. right? Uh, by essentially propagating states, right, and checking whether there's an accepting run of it on the tree. Okay. So that's how the proof goes, and uh, it is true that um, there's even a general theorem to, it says that if you can do such a kind of interpretation, then the class of graphs you started out with is of bounded tree width. So the class of graphs is of bounded tree width. Some other results. So it turns out that they're closed in a complement. And this is by chance. We did not design it to be closed in a complement at all. But it turns out that the class of all trees that correspond to you know, uh, words turns out to be regular. So you can complement the tree automata with respect to that class. And also it turns out that you can convert the tree automata back to this k phase multi stack visibly pushed on automata. And therefore, the, these automata are actually closed under complement, but complement with respect to k-phase words. Right? You can't complement with respect to all words. What, what does that mean? That means that you, if you're given a Boolean concurrent program, so for a particular k, it will accept a certain language. Yes. The complement of that language, yes. you will be able to construct another Boolean program yes. and yes. a k prime on the same k. The same k. Same k such that the complement will be accepted by that. Yes. So do you have any intuition about what that program will look like? <laughs> no, I don't think it's good to look upon it as programs. Look upon it as specifications. If you write the negation of a specification, 
yes. you can make it positive, and then you can intersect it with your program to check emptiness. Yes, sir. So, yeah. Is that streaming that you mentioned earlier? Sorry? So you mentioned the streaming property earlier. For the streaming problem is um, good enough. It, it's good enough if you do it for single stack mm -hmm. uh, VPA. I'm not going to talk about that at all. Sure. <laughs> um, so it turns out that the reachable configuration is not regular. That's very simple to see. You can, it, uh, an MVPA can, uh, can read A, B, C, N times and push A's and B's and C's onto three different stacks and then transfer the B's back to the first stack, transfer the C's back to the first stack, and then you have uh, something like A par N, D par N, E par N on the first stack, right? And uh, so clearly you can ha it's not even context-free. So the, the, the reachable configurations need not even be context-free. The emptiness result does hold for even if you did not have visibility, right? Uh, so you take a k-phase multi-stack automaton, which is not necessarily visibly pushed down. Okay, it can even have epsilon edges, uh, and you can decide the emptiness problem for this. Okay, and why is it true? If you look at the runs of this automaton, you can view the runs as a language, which is a k-mvpl, because given the run, you know whether it's pushing or popping. You can view that as a, a language, and you can check whether the language of accepting grounds is empty or not. Okay? So the result holds for non-visible as well. But of course, the robustness will not hold, because this is certainly more than context-free languages. Right? So the, the, you know, uh, that does not mean this, but it's not closed under union. It is closed under union, but not under intersection or complement. And the inclusion problem is undecidable. So we have also a Parikh theorem for this class. Um, so what is Parikh's theorem? Um, so a Parikh map maps any word W to this vector i, j, k, which tells you how many, how many letters there are in this word. Okay? So uh, there are i, a's, and uh, j, b's, and k, c's. Then you get the vector i, j, k. Okay? So that's how you map a word to a vector. And similarly, you can map a language to a class of vectors, right? And the Parikh theorem for context-free languages says that if you take any context-free language, there is actually a regular language such that the Parikh map of L is the same as the Parikh map for R. Okay. <coughs> so this means that if you take a context-free language over a one-letter alphabet, it is context-free if and only if it's regular. Okay. For example, if you take, so here's an example. If you take A par I, B par I, that's a context-free language. But I can find A, B star, right, which, which will map the vectors which I get from L. Okay. <coughs> and this you can use to show, for example, that A par I, where I equal to 2 par M, is, a, is ex exponential, I mean, is a, it's an exponent of 2, is not a CFL. Okay. So we can show a Parikh theorem for KMVPLs. So if L is a KMVPL, then there's a regular language R, such as the Parikh map of L is this Parikh map of R. Okay. So this is useful to show some things are not in this class. For example, I, we can show that this language which I just talked about, AI I equal to 2 par M, cannot be accepted by a multi-stack automaton, even if you are not visible on it. You can do anything on A's. You can have epsilon edges. You cannot accept this language with a bounded number of phases. Okay, okay so that's, that's the part about uh, KMVPLs. And uh, you know, the proofs are much more complex. And in, in fact, use MSO. So I do not want to give any details, any more details on it. So now I want to talk about this class, called, this, this class of automata called infinite automata, which I discovered only a few months back. And uh, they are very interesting, and we have some results uh, for them. OK, what's an infinite automaton? An infinite automaton looks like a D, an NFA, okay? except that it has infinitely many states. 
Okay? So you, don't, you drop the condition that you need only finitely, you have only finitely many states. You have an infinite number of states. Uh, you have an infinite number of initial states, you have an infinite number of final states, right? From one state you can get to an infinite number of states, the successor relation. So if you take a word, um, you can look at when this word, automaton accepts the word. It's very simple, is there a path from some initial state on the word to some final state? How do you describe these We'll come to that. Okay? This is what an infinite automaton um, is. Um, and it's not a full definition because I've not told you how to describe this. Okay, so the number of runs of a word on this automaton can how be infinite. Is this different from a label transition system? I mean, you could. So first, you view this acceptors, and it's infinite. And uh, but it still has a finite alphabet. It has a finite alphabet. It works on a finite alphabet. Um, yeah, you just drop the condition that it has finite many states. So how do we describe this? So you have an input alphabet sigma that's finite. Um, so what I'm going to do is represent states using words. Okay. So you fix an alphabet pi, which is completely independent of sigma. So here you don't even have the requirement that the, although it could be infinite, it has to be finitely branching. Nothing like that. No, no requirement. No requirement. All right. So the states are going to be all, all, all words over pi star, in, in pi star, okay? So your states are words over some alphabet. So I have a quick question. Does it have any connection with the previous part of the talk? Yes. So it does. Okay. But not to verification. I don't know any. Well, there is a mild connection, but not too much. Okay. So transitions are defined using uh, rewriting of words. So what you do is you, you, you give a finite machine that will rewrite one word into another and therefore describe the transition. So for each A in your, in your input alphabet, you have edges of the form of, uh, labeled A, right? And those are described by a single transducer TA, which is finite state, right? Which transforms words into words. So it takes a word U and it can rewrite into U, uh, U prime. Okay? And it's non-deterministic, so it can rewrite into many words. Okay? So you throw the edge u on a goes to u prime in the infinite automaton if and only if the uh, transducer can transform u to u prime. Yes? So does the structural requirements of the transducer and the structure on the infinite automaton itself? Yes. Yes. So, so we're going to do something interesting with it. So we, we don't want this set of all infinite automata. <coughs> okay. So the transitions. Um, so so let's look at an example. Okay. Let's look at regular infinite automata. Okay. R using where the transitions are defined using regular transducers. Okay. So you have uh, this alphabet pi. The states are words. And the transitions are defined using uh, regular transducers, where a regular transducer is just a finite state machine which reads an input word and writes to an output word. Right? So what it has is really uh, transitions of the form Q goes to Q prime on A, B, where A or B can be epsilon, right? which means I can read A and produce B. Okay? For example, here's a regular relation. Um, A par n goes to B, C par n. That's easy for a, for a regular transducer to do. It can read every A and rewrite to BC. And it keeps going and, and can rewrite A par N to BC par N. Okay. So these are called regular relations. These are the relation, I mean, if you study relations of words, this is the natural way to define uh, relations, uh, regular relations. Okay. A very natural class. And remember what this means is that from a state A par phi, you can go to BC par phi. So do these transducers versus state across No. You start with the initial state, and you look at the word, which is your current state, right? And it reads that word and gives you a new state by reaching a final state of it. Right? So what's the connection to verification is that 
what we're trying to do is you're looking at the systems, the infinite state systems that you get in verification, right? And you're trying to view them as computational devices. Okay? So, <clears throat> for example, if you take a pushdown system, the state is describable by the state, the control state, and the stack, which can be represented as a word. And you can use rewriting to say how the state evolves. Right? In fact, a regular transducer can do that evolution for you. Right? And what we want to do is look at these infinite state systems you get from verification and try to look upon them as computational devices. Okay? Um, there is this popular class of uh, machines people use for infinite state verification, this, this so-called uh, um, regular uh, model checking, which precisely does that. It represents states of uh, systems using words and uses regular relations to capture the relations between of how states uh, uh, move. Right? So the question is, can we, can we look at them as computational devices? <coughs> so here's a ni very nice theorem, which um, was proved by Mova and Sterling in 2001. If you take infinite automata with regular, so I didn't, I didn't tell you what these initial and final states for this regular automata are, these infinite automata are, but they're just regular, regular sets. Okay? So a regular set of words describe the initial states, a regular set of words describe the final states, and your transitions are described using regular rewriting. Okay? Then it turns out that these infinite automata precisely capture context sensitive languages, which is the class of languages uh, accepted in non-deterministic linear space. And the, the, uh, the part about the result which I really like is that, you know, it has, if you try to simulate a word on this infinite automata, it's not even clear it's, you can decide it. Right, because the, it, the infinite number of states you can start with, each can be written, rewritten uh, into, you know, there's a finite machine rewriting, but the infinite state space you're searching. Okay? It's not even clear it's decidable, right? Uh, but all these infinite automata turn out to be within recursively enumerable class, because a Turing machine can always guess these and simulate the moves of an infinite automata. So you stay within RE, but it's not clear it's re decidable. Right? And there is no no, uh, you know, in the definition of this infinite automata, there was no space or time bound requirements. Okay, it's a very logical, uh, you know, uh, definition based on the power of rewriting which you're giving to the, to the automata. So if you, you can ask other questions, if you take infinite state automata with prefix rewriting, prefix rewriting is where you take a word and you can only change the tail of the word. Okay? then you're exactly, but that looks like stacks, right? And it already, uh, it, it'll, it, it precisely define context-free languages. <coughs> so let's look at infinite state automata with more powerful kind of transducers. So let's look at infinite automata defined with pushdown transducers. So the word, the, the, the setting is the same, you have words as states, except that the tra pushdown transducer uh, transforms one input word into an output word, but you can use a work stack in order to do that. Okay? For example, if you take a to the n, it can, a pushdown transducer can take a to the n and write b to the n, c to the n. Okay? How does it do that? Every time it reads an a, it outputs um, b and also pushes b onto its stack. Right? Once it finishes with the a's, it can pop from the stack and write the c's. And this is not regular, by the way. So this is not a regular relation, it's a, it's a, but it's a pushdown. So it's a, these are called context-free transducers, and they're actually very well studied, um, algebraically and so on. If you put in this, uh, this requirement, infinite automata become too powerful. So infinite automata with pushdown transducer relations uh, define RE languages. It's undecidable. You get a huge class. It can simulate Turing machines and uh, you can't say anything interesting. So what we have is an infinite automaton characterization of the class 2E time, which is the complexity class of Turing machines, which, uh, of, of languages accepted by Turing machines in 2 power, 2 power order n time. Okay? How do we do this? We restrict the pushdown transducer in the following way. So the pushdown transducer is transforming one input word to an output word, 
is using a stack. But what we do is we, we restrict the pushdown transducer to switch between the read tape right, and reading the stack, which is popping the stack, only a bounded number of times. Okay? And it's, 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 still very, it's, it's still a very powerful model. So the same uh, transduction which I described is, uh, is doable by such a pushdown transducer. But the theorem is that infinite automata with this restricted kind of pushdown transducers precisely defines the class 2e time. Okay? And again, and this is at least context sensitive languages, you know, they are defined using, they are in the Chomsky hierarchy, they are defined using grammars, you can think of them as uh, rewriting in some sense. Um, but, you know, rewriting has never been used to capture complexity classes of this kind. Uh, so, <clears throat> and again, there is no, there is nothing here which sa talks about you know, double exponential or polynomial or linear or anything like that. Right? There is no uh, space or time requirement and it's a kind of logical characterization on the power of rewriting which gives you this um, uh, class 2 eta. So as I said, if you, even when you simulate this, you know, the, if you just naively simulate the infinite automaton on it, it can get, you can get into very long states. The words can get very long. It can run for a very long time, unbounded time, right? And um, uh, so, so the result is interesting. Um, and the upper bound is proved using what I pressed in the first half of the talk. So the requirement that you switch only between the stack and the input tape uh, only a, fine, a bounded number of times translates into the following. If you want to simulate a word W on this infinite state automaton, right, the empty, it, this reduces the membership problem for the infinite state automaton reduces to the emptiness problem. Right, for multi-stack automata <coughs> where the number of phases is not fixed but it depends on W. But you have only order W phases. So you can model the whole computation of the infinite state automaton using multiple multi-stack automata, three stacks, right? Uh, where you where you re do the rewriting using these multiple phases, and uh, you since you're doing with order W phases, you will uh, the emptiness problem can solvable in double exponential time in that. That's what gives the upper bound of two eta. So that should be alternate. So to summarize, you get alternate characterizations of complexity classes using rewrite theory. So rewriting is a very classic approach to defining computation itself. It goes back to the work of Thue and Post. But as I said, it has never been applied to complexity theory. And there is a connection to verification here, which I find pleasing. So for infinite automata to really take off, I think, there are a there are, um, couple of things one can do. Uh, one question is, can we show alternate proofs of classic results in complexity theory using this infinite automatic uh, um, results? <coughs> For example, we have an infinite automata characterization of n lin space. Can we show the immerman zelipson theorem saying n lin space is co n lin space using completely automata theoretic means? And the second question I think we can be, we can, um, it will be interesting is whether we can capture, capture P or NP using infinite automata. Okay. So this also relates to the um, logical cap capturing of complexity classes using finite model theory. So you can use logics on, let's say first order logics or uh, higher order logics to capture complexity classes. And one of the famous results is Fagan's theorem, which says that uh, the class NP can be captured using existential uh, second order logic on, on structures. Right? And there again, there's a similarity is that existential second order logic does not give you, you know, does not have any ostensible uh, requirements of polynomial uh, time in it, right? or anything polynomial, um, but it captures the uh, class NP. And it'll be nice whether, to see whether we can capture P or NP using infinite automata. Okay. Question. 
Yes. So there are, um, can't remember, <coughs> there's these results about Petri nets and also these systems where you have sort of a finite number of states, but like infinite numbers of processes, mm -hmm. where you can sort of count the number of processes in each state, which gives you a, a bounded vector, right? Does that, how do those results, the sort of the reachability in Petri nets and sort of these, uh, I can't remember what they're called, carbon. Vector additions. Huh? Vector additions. Thank you. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, the WQ, yeah. yeah. How, uh, can you embed those in this? Or? No, you can't. So, um, so, so as far as I know, so reachability is decidable for Petri nets, but Petri nets are not, they're not, they don't form a robust class um, in terms of, uh, you know, Boolean operations or something. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, so you could model Petri nets using essentially counters where you're not allowed to check for zero, yeah, right. right? And these are stacks. And these are in general are incomparable. Stacks give you this ordering. So you can do, you know, A par n, B par n, which a Petrinet can't do, um, right? And, uh, <coughs> um, but um, on the other hand, they give you counting properties which, which these systems can't do. So if you're very interested in counting, uh, that, is, that, is, that is better, but it's, this is, has the most stack flavor to it. Okay. There is one more, result, one more application of this, which I forgot to mention, is that using multiple stacks, you can you can model queues. Okay? So you think two stacks, you can essentially model a queue, and you can show that K phase queue systems are actually decidable. Uh, where you know you do context switching between K, you know, K times, but these uh, these processes now use queues to communicate to other processes, then it turns out that it, you can you can show using our results that it's decidable. So so the Petronet literature is also associated with all this queuing because you queue the number of processes and you access them in any order you want. Whereas if you want a FIFO order, um, you, you could use us, our Can results. You say again, please, what you mean with the queue system, what is the decidable exactly? A Petri net you can use to model queues right. where the ordering of the queue does not matter. Right, so it's a simplified version of, of right. queue. That I understand. But now if you have like an unbounded FIFO queue? Yes, if you have an unbounded FIFO queue, and, but you're allowed to switch context switch only k times between processes. Okay. So you can NQ. So if one process can run, it can NQ and DQ from what, one queue at, least, what, at most. Right? It does that, and then you switch over to another process which can do the DQing and so, NQing. So the fundamental thing is that if you have finite state processes, but a single unbounded queue. Many that, unbounded queues is fine. But if you have single unbounded queue, reachability is undecidable for it. Yes. And if you have multiple queues also, reachability continues to be undecidable. But what you're saying is that if you have multiple queues, <coughs> but you bound the number of times you context switch between the different processes, then it's reachability is decidable. <coughs> so this whole, even if the processes have stacks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you can mix everything together? Yes. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Okay, so so uh, I presented this K-phase multi-stack automata. Um, I I'm not very happy with the definition. I, I do know that whenever I present this definition, it sounds very awkward. Why am I popping from only one stack? What if I push in one stack but pop from all stacks? You know, I can ask a, a multitude of questions of this form. We have asked those questions and tried to come up with a generalization, and we worked on it for like one and a half years, and we still can't figure out what is the uh, what is the right answer for that? Is there a natural characterization of a class, you know, which is uh, which corresponds to bounded tree width, right? So that's the main question, I think, is that if you're given nested, multiply nested words, when does it give you bounded tree width, right? Bounded tree width. Oh, I really, uh, it's a very complex definition of bounded tree width. Bounded tree width is a very complex definition. I can't. No, what does that have to do with everything you've told us? So because that's what makes emptiness decidable. I see. Right? This interpretation onto trees, when will it work? Right? And we don't know what is the la largest class, and uh, I would love to know what, what that class is. Um, so so what, we have, what we know, however, is that you get one deci robust, decidable class of context-sensitive languages, um, and uh, I think that's interesting. Um, we also define this infinite automata with pushdown rewriting, 
and shown a characterization of uh, this complexity class. So in terms of future work, there's one thing which I want to do is see if K phase MVPA yield better coverage for model checking concurrent Boolean programs. Right. Um, so, so though it's double exponential in K, um, I think you know, even with K equal to one or two, you might get a vast coverage because you're essentially allowing all processes to move, right? And I think this makes especially sense when you have, let's say, you're, you're, you're simulating, let's say, ten threads, right? And unless you do ten context switches, you're not probably going to get anywhere in terms of realizing the reachable state space. Whereas even with two phases, you might reach a large amount of state space because you're employing all the processes at the same time, right? But coming up with a practical algorithm for doing this and checking that would be interesting. That's it. Thank you.